You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Well, seems like we've got spring again. Crazy. It's going to get up into the lower 80s this week. Uh, amazing as far as the weather is concerned. But it was a beautiful after- afternoon and early evening in Tuscaloosa Saturday night as Alabama broke a 21-21 tie at the half and just dominated the second half against a very good LSU team, particularly offensively. And Alabama goes on to win it by a score of 42-28. to Enjoyable game to watch. The crowd was involved. All kinds of different things to talk about in this game. But just overall, Lars, first of all, did you have a good weekend with your chilling? And what did you think about the game? Had a wonderful weekend. Uh, got out on the golf course with Lincoln. Always a great time. I thought it was Alabama's best game of the year by far. And uh, it feels like Jalen Milro has finally arrived as uh, as the as as a upper level uh, borderline elite quarterback, a, a college football quarterback. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Tommy Reese just tailored the game plan perfectly to suit his strengths. I, I thought. Just uh, that, uh, again, Jalen Milroe just played outstanding. He was just named co-offensive uh, SEC Player of the Week, and deservedly so, Matt. Yeah. It was a different quarterback, and it was different play calling, and it was different confidence, even though he showed confidence earlier in the season. This, was, this game was, you know, was, Alabama's defense played really well, particularly in the second half. Um, I, th- I think something's gone kind of under the radar. Just need to tip our toe once again to Will Reichert 500 points in his career that's that's just incredible and then what does he do in celebration of that he misses too but with Will Reichert I think he just skate right past that and then you know there are a lot of people talking about whether or not it should be in targeting on Dallas Turner and all these other kind of things to you know just post game commentary that's what people do but here we go all in all i think alabama proved worthy of competing for an nc here's nick um there's you know probably the most complete game we played all year um especially the way we executed in the second half i thought offensively you know we controlled the line of scrimmage we had great balance Jalen played really well obviously you know being the player of the week um but you know i think that um you know, this team has created an opportunity for itself, so everybody's got to make a choice on, you know, what, what do you want to do to prepare and to continue to play at the level that we're capable of playing at and to continue to improve. And, um, you know, I don't think this is a time for anybody to be complacent. Um, I know that even Sunday morning when I got up, you know, I was like, wow, I'm tired, you know, but got to go man you got to keep going you got to keep grinding you got to keep um focused on what you have to do to get better and to prepare for the next game because you know kentucky is completely different type of team uh, than what we played against a week ago and what we did last week is not going to have any impact on what we do this week um they're tough they're physical they're well coached you know um you know coach stoops does a really really good job with his team in terms of you know the competitive character that they play with and the intangible that intangibles that they have and you know they're six and three uh and you know they've got some really explosive players on offense the quarterback has played really well for them they've got great balance on offense their defense is tough and physical and uh really well coached in terms of what they do um uh, you know uh barry and brown is a really good uh returner so they've got lots of good players, uh, very challenging preparation uh, for both sides of the ball. Start here with Nick. Yeah, do you have an update on the, the health of Deontay and uh, I just forgot, the, uh, Jalen Key? <laughs> no, I don't really. Um, you know, I think we, we would prepare to play in this game because, you know, both guys have injuries that, you know, are – day to day in terms of what they're going to be able to do so it's not just a matter of whether they would be ready to play in a game but can they practice enough to be ready to play in a game so that's going to be you know day to day um so you know both guys i would have to say if you have to say would be questionable uh, because it is questionable because i don't know what they're going to be able to do from day to day katie 
Hello. What went into getting Jay Miller and Kendrick Law more involved on offense this past week? And just what can you what can you say about their patience of kind of waiting their turn this year and being ready when their name is called? Well, K Law has been a significant player for us all year long, especially on special teams, and he's had some role on offense. But uh, we did expand that role a little bit. You know, um, guy's a great competitor, a really hard worker. Uh, he's got a, a skill set that I think uh, can be utilized offensively, and I think we're starting to use that. Uh, Jam has played really, really well all year long. You know, Jace has, you know, played a lot of football this year and a little bit banged up, so those guys have gotten more reps in practice. So obviously wanted to give him and Roy Dale both um, a little more time in the game, and both guys came through and did a really good job. Uh, what do you remember about the 2002 game when you were at LSU at Kentucky with the Hail Mary? <laughs> uh, look, I remember we didn't play very well. Um, I remember they poured Gatorade on the coach already. Uh, I remember there was about a 30-mile-an-hour wind um, that we had at our back. Uh, and the guy threw the ball, and it just kept going and going and going. Then their guys misjudged the ball and tipped it, and uh, Devery Henderson caught it and ran for a touchdown. So um, that's basically what I remember. <laughs> From a novice perspective, this offense seems to get more multiple every week. Is that just a byproduct of Jalen earning the coaching staff week by week, or is this just the evolution of this offense? No, I think that um, it's probably a combination of both. Uh, I think as Jalen gets more comfortable, more confident, um, is reading and seeing things so he can actually do a little more uh, and do some different things. Uh, but I also think that you know the rest of the guys around him are getting more comfortable and uh, executing better. So all those things contribute to us being able to do a few things that you know we can take advantage of but that's different you know every week in terms of what kind of defense are you playing and what do they do and uh, how can you try to take advantage of it with jacory brooks's role in the offense being smaller this year than last year how has he handled that in terms of maturity attitude mental approach those things well he's done a great job he's done a great job on special teams he's been a little hurt you know which has contributed to you know his role to some degree um and um i'm but he's been great you know he's done a great job on special teams he's done everything we've asked him to do uh, when he's gone in the game, he's done a, a really good job of, of doing what he needs to do. But uh, he got his shoulder banged up, which has been a little bit of an issue for him all year, you know, in the game. So we'll see how that goes this week as well. Charlie? A, a guy we haven't asked about in a while is Devontae Smith. Just how's he coming along in his recovery? Uh, he's actually getting to the point where he's able to do uh, dry land running. Um, I think he's gotten up to like 80% or something like that. So uh, he's getting closer, um, but we just have to wait and see. That's kind of day-to-day, -to -day too. Nick, Alvarez. What has uh, Malachi Moore meant to the team in bringing energy, but also in being able to be versatile in the secondary? Well, Malachi's a great leader, but he's also, you know, very smart. He's got lots of experience. He understands the system of what we do. I think he really helps the other guys with adjustments uh, that we need to make uh, in the game. And, um, you know, he's been invaluable. Uh, he's played well. And um, I think he's helped everybody around him play play better. Okay, we got two more, Tony and then Mike. You've really been able to shut teams down in the second half on defense, or at least improve on defense. How much does that say to what kept the job Kevin's done and making adjustments in games? Yeah, well, we all contribute to trying to make adjustments in the games, and Kevin's done a really, really good job. He's in the box, so he has a really good perspective of, you know, what's what what, what we didn't do correctly, what we need to fix, what's not working, uh, what might work better. So, um, but I think we also do a great job on the sidelines of showing the players the series before. And um, the first series of the second half was not a good one for us, but um, we actually played better um, toward the end of the game. Uh, but I think we need to uh, have a little more consistency 
you know, the drive right before the half was not great, and the first drive of the second half was not great. But uh, then I thought we played really, really well after that. But we, we, we just want to try to um, – we're getting a lot of stuff, man, lots of multiples that the players have to adjust to. And um, we, we want to do more things but make it simpler for the players so that we, we, we can actually do these things and be able to adjust to all the stuff that we're seeing um, so that they're confident that they can make the adjustments we need to make. Finish with Mike. What was your perspective on Dallas's roughing call and just what the technical coaching point would be there? Uh, look, I don't, I don't know if there is a technical coaching point. You know, you always tell players you want them to see what they hit. Uh, you know, he hit the guy here and then he hit him sort of in the chin. So it wasn't like a direct hit or an intentional hit to the head. Um, it was a really good hit, but um, unfortunately, you know, his helmet did slide up and hit the guy, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a foul. If you hit the quarterback in the head, it's just going to get called all the time. And um, we just want to have him keep his eyes up and see what he hits and hopefully target down a little bit so it doesn't happen again. All right, Coach, thank you. All right, thank you. That may be the most talked about play of the game, but there are others, and Lars Anderson and myself, Matt Coulter, will be talking about them throughout the show. Nick Kelly, I think you just heard him ask a couple of questions in the Saban News Conference. He's going to join us in about an hour, so that'll be good info. But uh, that was like a Xerox Friday afternoon news conference, man. It was short, sweet, and out of here. And I think that's what Alabama wants to do. When they travel to Kentucky, we'll talk about the Wildcats as well. Got it. Hey, and guess what? There's basketball tonight. Got a lot of stuff to talk about as you listen to Big Noon Sports presented by Haley Sansing. Speaking of upcoming, she'll be with us tomorrow night. Haley Sansing, tomorrow afternoon. Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage, back in just a couple of minutes. Thanks for listening in. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A mild afternoon with a good supply of sunshine. The high today, 77. Tonight, fair with the low at 53. And the weather stays dry tomorrow and Wednesday. Partly to mostly sunny both days. Highs between 78 and 81. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 76 degrees in Tuscaloosa. Covering SEC sports like Good Zoo on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. And here we are. Man, what a gorgeous Monday afternoon. Seems like we've even got a little bit of a touch of humidity back in the air. But that won't last long. By the end of the week, we're going to be down to normal early winter type temperatures in the state of Alabama. You're listening to Big Noon Sports, Matt Coulter, Lars Anderson, Justin Jones, talking about Alabama's 42-28 to victory uh, over LSU this past Saturday night. Lars, a lot has been made about the hit on Jaden Daniels, and I thought uh, they made the right call, and in fact, this is not going over popular. I thought it could have been called targeting as well based on where his helmet hit the face mask. Yeah, um, I agree with you on that. And I think uh, Coach Saban basically confirmed that he he agreed with the call as well. Um, I don't think it was anything intentional, wasn't trying to hurt him. But, um, you know, it, uh, it's, it's football and it happens. Um, but again, I, I just... I, I got to go back to Jalen Milrow. Um, you know, because, I, yeah, I understand that that hit is, is going to be talked about, but the story of the game is not that hit. The story of the game is Jalen Milrow. And, you know, I am not a Heisman voter. Uh, I did have a vote years ago, but um, frankly, I just, I, I gave it up. Um, but I talked to a, a bunch of my friends on uh, Sunday who are Heisman voters, and suddenly Jalen Milrow is in the conversation. I'm not saying he's going to win the Heisman based off of one performance, but he did things on Saturday night that you just 
you have we haven't seen a quarterback do this before, right? Have you ever seen a quarterback run over a safety and then on the next play drop a perfectly floated uh, pass for a, a long gain? Have you ever seen a quarterback spin away from a linebacker, twist away from a defensive end, and then throw it 60 yards down the field? I mean, have you ever seen a quarterback do the uh, tush push, and you turn that into a, 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 you know, you're just pushing forward, right? It's a play that popularized by uh, Jalen Hurts and the Eagles. you ever seen a quarterback turn the tush push into a four-yard off-tackle touchdown? I mean, he just was amazing. I just uh, he he may be the best athlete at the quarterback position that Nick Saban has ever had, and that is saying a lot, Matt. It helped that it looked like they put more design runs in, and I don't think there was any question. In fact, I think I saw Tommy Reese put several new wrinkles into the Alabama offense, and I liked them, and they were successful. And yes. <laughs> Man, Milrow played one of the best games at quarterback we've ever seen in Crimson. But I have to push on the Heisman talk. Come on. No, I'm, I'm not. I, look, I'm no, not saying. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying he will get votes. I, I, I'm just saying. Really I'm just think telling. Get votes. I am. I'm just telling you what I am. I'm a merely a conduit of information here, Matt. I'm not. I'm not saying that I, I would vote for him or I would even put him in the top five, but um, I'm just saying people are talking about him because of what they saw on the biggest stage on Saturday night. And um, and look, what LSU tried to do was it was pretty obvious they were not going to allow him to, to throw over the top. Right, because uh, it, heading into the game uh, in the five SEC games since Bill Rose been starting, he's hit 25 of 40 passes that traveled at least 15 yards in the air. Right, so that's uh, uh, really down the field throws, and that's an average of five completions a game on eight attempts. So what does LSU do? They take that away. And uh, he was only one of seven on attempts of 15 yards that uh, where the ball traveled 15 yards in the air against LSU. So what does he do? He adjusts his game, right? And, and I think uh, Tommy Reese adjusted it too uh, by, um, by, you know, playing to his strength, right? A good team, a good player figures out their own strengths and plays to it. And and the great players figure out ways to win even when their biggest strength is taken away. And that's what Jalen did, right? They, his biggest strength always this whole year has been the deep ball. And that wasn't going to happen because of the way that LSU was playing Alabama. So he adjusts and uh, and put on the finest performance of his career. Now, look, I agree, like the Heisman stuff is, is, is overheated, but I'm just telling you that, that he's gotten some attention uh, from Heisman voters. And that is something that is a remarkable statement given where he was uh, earlier this season, meaning on the bench against South Florida. Yeah, and that South Florida game may have uh, contributed. No, not may have. I think it's contributed to his play since and uh, certainly his play against LSU. I, I just think that uh, the talk of Heisman is, uh, I don't know. Is it no, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying win the Heisman. Not <laughs> okay, okay. You're not All letting right. me finish. All right, sorry, the, sorry, the, Matt. Your friends that are talking about Heisman are full of it because that's just not going to happen. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there any chance, given the no. games, the rest of the season? Okay, all right. No. That's my point. No, I'm uh, just saying he's 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 being he's he is now thought of in an entirely new light. That's I should that I, I should not have yeah. said I, sh I shouldn't have used the word Heisman. He's he's thought of well, in a, in a different. He's viewed differently now than he ever has been before because what he did on the field on Saturday night was not a fluke. <laughs> that was no, a player played, that, that was a player who has figured some things out. Don't you agree? Yeah, if he had played similarly earlier in the year, then he would he would have been in the Heisman talk a lot a lot, a lot sooner. 
I just think that that's kind of crazy because it's just quite simply it's not going to happen. But the point you make, and if this is your point from the beginning, is well taken and it's spot on. Is does he have eyeballs on him now where he didn't have them on earlier in the season? Absolutely right. And some of the plays he made, God, manning up on a couple of, instead of running out of bounds, running into safeties. Just um, a beast. They, they, <laughs> might, they might have a little talk with him about some of his physical contact. But then he complimented, complimented that with some really, really terrific passing, too. And All in all, Alabama's offense, I love the play of their running backs. Um, kept thinking they were going to break one for 60. They would break one for 15 or 20, which is pretty good, but always getting four or five. I think Alabama's offensive line, Lars, talk about them for a minute. I think that they played their best game of the year by far. Oh, absolutely. And um, look, this is an LSU defense that is was not great, uh, but uh, I did not think Alabama was going to put up 42 on them. That, that's for sure. Um, and uh, in you know, I thought it was interesting, too, uh, during his interview session after the game, Jalen Milroe told media members, I think it was three times, uh, that he was, quote, not a finished product. Um, but still, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a quarterback improve so much from September to November as Jalen. I mean, really, it's just, uh, it's it's crazy. And, you know, um he was, he was even offered, and I see after the game, a reporter asked him to make his case for the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> okay, and he said, he said, and he, and he basically just said, "I'm not anywhere where I want to be." Um, and and I I get that that was sort of a ridiculous question, and then he, and he said he said the perfect thing, um, and it will be interesting uh, in this upcoming game against Kentucky, Matt. That's coming off in an emotional win and you're going on the road to a place that Alabama doesn't play that often for whatever reason, scheduling quirks. Um, it, it, and we'll get into it throughout the week, but uh, I, I think this could be uh, a bit of a, uh, it's almost like it's not a trap game, but it's a, it's just one of those games that could be closer than we think it should be. Yeah, I agree with you. And it ought to it ought to keep Alabama's attention this week for sure, and I think it will. Uh, these are games in the past. Uh, even if the other team did play Alabama tough for a while, Alabama eventually pulls away. Nick Saban does not make a habit of losing these games, and uh, I don't think this is going to happen. But you can't take Kentucky lightly. Just ask Tennessee. Kentucky almost beat them, and uh, they've played heads up on a lot of teams on their schedule, and that will continue. I want to go back to the offense, and I want to just kind of let's let's throw up some confetti for the coaches. I, I thought I think Tommy Reese, who was under fire earlier in the year, has uh, you know he is gradually and uh, becoming a really good play caller, and that's why Alabama's putting forty two up on on LSU. But also to Eric Wolford and um, the offensive line coach. That line has, you know, the only part of that football team that's gotten better and better as much week to week is Milrow. Um, yeah. The offensive absolutely. line. But then the defensive line and Freddie Roach. And, man, I thought Kevin Steele worked magic in the second half. In the second half, they rushed five, and they tried to keep Jalen Daniels more in a cup. And he still couldn't do it. But they were better at doing it, and it was a passing play where Alabama's rush from the outside kept Daniels in the pocket when he got hit in the face mask. So, uh, you know, I think the coaches are improving just as much as the team is, and that's a really good thing to see. Yeah, um, and uh, I thought the defense just showed uh, great resilience, uh, made big plays when they had to. Uh, Jaden Daniels, he is special. Do you think how, how good of an NFL player do you think he'll be, know. Matt? I knew you were going to ask me that, and you're better at breaking down in the NFL. I just don't know, but every time I, we are seeing quarterbacks run more. Look at Jalen Hurts; he's the leading touchdown quarterback scorer in Philadelphia history. And by the way, that includes Randall Cunningham. Wow. And it, 
He hasn't been playing that ball. But, um, you know, I'm just going to have to DQ myself. I'll think yeah. about it more and more. But you're you're an NFL guy. Do you think he will be above, an above average or a clipboard holder? What's his future? I, I, I'd really have to look into it more. But I, I think he just seems like he, he strikes me as a winner. You know, I know things things didn't go his way on Saturday night, but he just he is uh, he's got a, a, a special charisma to him, an attitude of uh, confidence that he projects that all the great quarterbacks, especially one Joe Burrow who torched the Buffalo Bills on Sunday night, uh, he's just got he's got that it factor. Torched when you win by seven. No, he played great. Oh, I know. Joe you. Burrow played great. We need a, a a jar that Lars has to put a dollar into every time he mentions Nebraska or Joe Burrow. <laughs> well, you and I would be at Orange they, Beach in a couple well, of Well, uh, well, they did on on the telecast on uh, Sunday night. They did show a picture of Joe Burrow as a kid wearing a Nebraska uniform, and I I just you know take take me now, God, take me now. <laughs> Uh, on that note, we'll take a break. Be back. <laughs> By the way, if you'd like to join us, we got 30 minutes of full bore big noon sports, and you can call us. Hey, your comments on the LSU game, please. They are welcome at 205-342-9904. Back in a second. Securing the best mortgage possible requires a lender who has knowledge, is trustworthy, and treats customers like family. And no one is better at all of this than the mortgage miracle worker, Haley Sansing. Based right here in Tuscaloosa, Haley Sansing has spent decades working in the mortgage industry. With Haley, it's personal, holding your hand from contract to close. With Haley, it's about one thing, you. Call Haley on her cell, yes, her cell, 205-792-1813. That's 205-792-1813. Let Haley help you. NLMS number 230376. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. with Lars Anderson. Appreciate you folks dialing us in. Nick Saban Saturday night. Oh, the fans are great. I mean, it was great. I mean, the atmosphere was great. It cost them some penalties and critical times in the game, which gave us a favorable down a distance, which helped us on defense uh, tremendously. Uh, but the atmosphere in the stadium in the last two games, I don't think you could ever ask for more. And I certainly thank the fans for it. Uh, I asked them to do it. They responded really well. They played for 60 minutes, just like our players, and um, God love them for it. You know, that's a, that's a quote I think should be used over and over again, and probably will be, <clears throat> that the uh, fans played for 60 minutes just like the players did. That's great. And Lars... I think they had significant impact, uh, particularly on two penalties in the second half when they they contributed to five yard pre snap penalties on LSU. Yeah, and um, stop yeah. drives, Lars. They stopped uh, yeah. drives. No, and look, LSU entered the game averaging forty seven and a half points uh, per game and uh, held to seven in the second half. And I think a uh, big reason, or a reason, uh, was uh, was the fans. And uh, I mean, there was uh, some stuff on social media gro- going around that the fans broke uh, the decibel record at Bryant-Denny Stadium 
during uh, Terry and Arnold's interception in the fourth quarter with the, the meter going to 113.1, whatever whatever the heck that means. But <laughs> it underscores a large... Decibel level, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, but it underscores a larger point that, uh, again, I, I was not there in attendance. I, I was on uh, kid duty, and uh, kids really had a good time watching the game. But um, uh, it, it seemed to me from afar... And again, and then, and then talking to people who were there, that it uh, these last two uh, home games were as loud as, as any in sort of recent memory. Because, I mean, you know this, and we talked about it, Matt, and you know it's far better than I do. The... Uh, uh, the history of Alabama fans that, that and, and that their the the caricature is that they sit on their hands, right? That they don't make a lot of noise. But doesn't it just seem different these last two home games? Absolutely, like nothing I've ever seen at Alabama. And I've used the term hand sitting, and, and I don't think it's fair, really, because that would that would mean Alabama fans are very complacent. They're not and never have been. They've been they've all always cheered for their Crimson Tide. But I, I just at times it just didn't seem like it was as much as others. But I've done a little thinking on this, Lars. You know, some of this has to do with the configuration of your stadium. Mm-hmm. And you know, places that you've been to Tiger Stadium, that to me is more conducive for keeping the sound inside. Mm-hmm. You know, Alabama's kind of open. But that being said, I heard the very same thing after the ball game that it went to 113 on the decibel scale, something like that. And it was very, very loud. Even on television, you could tell when yeah. Dallas Turner tipped that pass and Terry and Arnold caught it for the interception. It was unbelievably loud. And I'm talking Tiger Stadium loud. Uh, Auburn loud but uh, and it was also maybe I mean there were several big plays in that game would would that be the biggest or is it fair to pick one out that's right there among them Um, yeah Uh, what did you think just uh, right away it just felt like the atmosphere was as electric as it's been in a long time and also it, it, it's it, it felt like at least watching it on television it felt like the players really fed off of that i mean right out of the gate i believe you're exactly right yeah they can feel it they do feel it and it does have an influence there is absolutely no question about it yeah, I, it was really, really good to see, and that's two in a row, and you just kind of hope it, 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 you can maintain that. But it's not going to happen this year because we're all Alabama's on the road. Then you got UTC, and that's you know you expect kind of the norm when you have a UTC when the mocks come to town. And then the last game of the year is at Auburn. You know, you know go ahead, Justin. Uh, sorry, I, I just have a, a quick fun fact that I think Lars is going to like. The uh, 113 was the the loudest point on Saturday for us, and that was after the Terion Arnold interception. The loudest college football game ever came in at 133.6 decibels in Husky Stadium, Washington. And any mm-hmm. guess what team they were playing? <laughs> they were playing Nebraska. They yes, were playing Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know why it's so loud there? Because Matt was talking about the configuration of Brian Denny and how it's open. But at Husky Stadium, it's like they have these tin roofs, right, that, that, that cover it because it's constantly raining in Seattle. And the sound goes up and it comes right back down. <laughs> and right. it gets so loud there uh, that it uh, – and I, I've covered games there. And it that probably would have been the Nebraska game and maybe uh, – I think it's when they beat Nebraska, maybe in 1990. 92. 92. Okay, I was close. I was close. (laughs) Um, Steve Etman was on that team, I believe. The defensive tackle was pick number one overall. But, but Matt, you you have a unique uh, way to uh, analyze the impact of a crowd because for years you traveled week in and week out with UAB, 
right? And so you would see um, how they uh, reacted to the home crowd and then how they reacted to an opposing crowd and not just um you know on television it's hard to see but you are there in the stadium and able to see you know body language what's going on on the sideline confusion uh is there any game that that sticks out in your mind of uh, of uh, uh of of when they were really impacted by a crowd on the road uh, in uh, and also you know, there's just some teams for some reason they play really well on the road. And right. uh, our buddy Jay Barker said he just he loved playing on the road. He loved everything about it. He enjoyed playing on the road. I mean, about as much as playing at home. What what do you think it is that enables a team to be really good in a in a loud, hostile environment? First, in reference to the loudest ever. And I didn't have a measurement device to uh, refute the reports of the Washington, Nebraska. But I was there in 86 when Auburn was playing at LSU. And LSU scored in the waning moments of the fourth quarter. And that's the one that set off the seismograph. Yeah, that's, that's the earthquake the, game, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the earthquake game. And and that's the loudest I've ever heard. I couldn't talk to my photographer and he was six inches away. Uh, it was amazing. And it was sustaining, too. But I will say this about observations on the road. Uh, I think at times silence is equally compelling to a visiting team. When you can shut the crowd up, that fires you up. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, silence is deafening and inspiring to a visiting team. Yeah, there's actually more power, right, that you feel when you... Yeah quiet somebody and you shut them up than when you fire them up. Yep. That is totally true. That's interesting. I just, I I never thought of it that way. Well, it's pretty cool. Uh, And let me tell you, uh, college crowds, I was watching some of the pregame stuff of the Alabama, you know, the tailgating, what's going on in the quad, the way 66-year-old men dress up. And it's just... There is nothing like it. And um, I'll share a quick story about that when we get back. You're listening to Big Noon Sports. It is presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Warden. Inside the Alabama Crimson Tide with the Gary Harris Show. Hey, everybody, it's Gary Harris. We got a jam packed Gary Harris Show on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. The head coach of the Alabama baseball team, Rob Vaughn, will join me to talk about the great fall the Crimson Tide is having, plus Rudy Armand and the Titans report with Kayla Anderson. All that at 9 a.m. on the Gary Harris Show Tuesday morning. Catch the Gary Harris Show Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. on Tide 100.9 and Tide100.9.com. Laura Lee Thompson is known. Known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama Broker, who's as roll tied as houndstooth, will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205 790 7229. Again, that's 205-790-7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at the That's Laura Lee at the 
Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A mild afternoon with a good supply of sunshine. The high today, 77. Tonight, fair with the low at 53. And the weather stays dry tomorrow and Wednesday. Partly to mostly sunny both days. Highs between 78 and 81. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 75 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Well, I mean, it's obvious that the guy is much more comfortable as a passer. He's um, reading things more quickly, getting the ball to the right guy. He's making really good decisions when he has to improvise. Um and uh, those things, we want to continue to help him grow and develop. Uh, but I think he's learned to play the next play. You know, I think that, you know, early in the year, he would get frustrated if he made a bad throw or whatever. And, you know, now he's learning to play the next play. You know, and that's what I told the players, you know, before we played the game. I said, you got to keep playing the next play. You got to be in the moment because the next play may be the play that is the difference in the game when you play games like this. So you can't worry about what happened on the last play, whether it was good or bad or whatever. And, um, you know, he he's bought into that, and I think that's helped him uh, be more consistent. Lars, as he has progressed and obviously gotten better, don't you think that uh, bounces around the heads of the coaches on the opposing schedule? <laughs> as, yeah. You know, now the way you have to defend this guy is totally different than the way you did uh, from Texas on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he just came out and he just, it's almost like he, he looked like a different player. You know, it, it was, he, he, he played with confidence, uh, with a, an assuredness. And, and uh, yeah, LSU threw some things at him that, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily expecting meaning really just taking away the 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 longer throws and playing the safeties deep so that opens up the run and i think the more active he is in the running game it it gives him confidence because let's be you know let's be frank here like this guy is a dynamic runner I mean, he is. I, I'm I'm trying to think of a of an of an equivalent, and I, I go back to like, uh, you know, Thomas Lott, Elvis Peacock, <laughs> the the uh, wow. those, those oh, yeah. I'm dropping some old school wishbone quarterback from Oklahoma names uh, that just uh, would absolutely, you know, uh, just eat your lunch uh, by running the ball, running the option. And I'd actually love to see a little, little more option game in uh, it, it, with Alabama. And I, I thought the running backs ran with more sort of uh, authority. I don't know. It, it just seemed different to me. Everything seemed different about this offense. Yeah, and it changed. Well, I knew you know they're going to put new wrinkles in, but some of the wrinkles that they put in, I didn't, I didn't see coming. I knew there was going to be some triple option put in there. I liked it. It was successful. But there were completely different formations as well, and I think they kind of threw LSU for a loop. Yeah, um, that all, you know, all benefited the Alabama offense. And, and let's let's talk about somebody else who's been on the field. He's played every game, but Jam Miller had a significant role in this football game. And yeah, he had the one really good catch and run for like thirty-five yards. It was his only catch, but he also ran the football a couple of times. But the time he picked up the blitz and allowed Milrow to step up in the pocket and complete a pass, I mean, he's Miller is not a huge guy. He took on a linebacker's probably close to twice his size. I don't know if you remember that play or not. CBS noted it, and they replayed it because little 26 got up in a gap and just, I'm not going to say <laughs> he flattened yeah. a linebacker, but he took him out of the play. Yeah, um, I don't know if you remember that or not, Lauren. No, I do. I do. It's, and it's just, I, I, it's almost like on really good offenses, everything obviously starts with the quarterback. And when your quarterback is is, you see your quarterback uh, just absolutely 
again, taking on safeties, taking on linebackers, and not only that, winning, like running over guys, <laughs> then guys who are maybe a little more diminutive, they're going to step up and they are going to put their, uh, they're going to put their body on the line to make sure that they're doing everything they can to help their quarterback who's making play after play after play. But uh, uh, Justin, I, I wanted to bring you in on the conversation here. And this is kind of a, maybe a little bit of a difficult question, but other than Jalen Milroe, right, who played the game of his life uh, at Alabama, at least, um, who would be your second MVP, offensive MVP of the game on Saturday night? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, hmm. I think Dallas Turner had a great game. I really want to look to the defensive backs, though. I think besides the one touchdown that they had LSU at the start, which was kind of a, a misread, I believe it was Caleb Downs, kind of played up instead of playing back, which allowed uh, Malik Neighbors to get over the top. I saw a lot of uh, plays from, uh, I want to say it was Kool-Aid McKinstry that just absolutely shut down receivers, which Jaden Daniels did gash us with those quarterback scrambles, but the reason those happened is because that that first option or the second option wasn't available and he's stuck back there having to make a play which in the end he, he Jaden Daniels is so good that it, it worked out for them on most of those plays but it opens up the opportunity and gave Alabama the opportunity to get tackles for losses um, get tip passes which resulted in the interception so I'd, I'd have to go with Kool-Aid Matt how about you wow um Fortunately, you asked him first and gave me a little time to think about it. Um, I don't know that he's going to step up every single game. I thought Isaiah Bond had a great game. Yeah. So I might I might throw him um, a vote or two in that direction. But I will agree with something you said. I think all three running backs that got significant playing time were uh, really caught up in the offense and um, caught up in the moment. And um, the – Three of them, I think, had close to 150 yards, and then <laughs> Jalen had the rest. Just amazing numbers from a quarterback. And the question you asked a minute ago is going to trouble me to the point where I'm probably going to go to the internet and look look something up to give me an idea of the answer. But a quarterback that runs and passes like Milrow does right now, um, particularly in Alabama history. Remember, Walter Lewis could run a little bit and pass yeah. a little bit, but, you know, that was 40 years ago. Um, well, we're, not that that makes any what about, difference. What about, what about Joe Namath? I mean, I, I look, he I know. Like I, I, but at, at, didn't he run like that at Alabama, though? I mean, Before he got hurt. But he, before he, was, he got hurt. I don't think – I think you would think of him as pass, pass, run. Yeah. Third or something, but um, – I don't know. Even in the Midwest era, you mentioned those kind of those bone and option quarterbacks. Um, they were. I mean, I, good. I I think the greatest college football player of all time was Tommy Frazier. So I I I, I am hesitant to throw his name out there, but they have they are similar. I think this I actually. Happens. Think this, yeah. this happens a lot when you uh, live in Alabama and you cover games and you're around it. You've been around it particularly. Blake Sims, Kerry Clark just chimed that one in. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah, that um, is a good one. But, you know, we all experience this probably every season. Uh, somebody that's uh, very much out of the loop, uh, coming from another region of the United States, uh, and in this case a friend of friend was telling me about these people who were coming down from the Wyoming area to see an Alabama football game. And guess one, guess which one they picked? or was selected for them. It was Saturdays. Mm. And they kept getting texts and calls. And said, this is the most unbelievable thing I've ever witnessed in my life. And <laughs> if you've never been around it, I mean, and you are going to be impressed when you walk in and you see the tailgate parties. And, and it's not just the fact that they've got a bucket of fried chicken and a cold beer. These tailgate parties are elaborate. And the food they serve, if you've never been to one and then that's the first one you go to, you go, my goodness. Uh, uh, I, I Matt, think the I, first thing you think about is, man, these people are rich. 
Matt, I couldn't believe it when I moved here. Um, you know, I had thought that there's no way that a game day experience could be any better than Memorial Stadium as a fan. And then I went to Brian Denny for the first time, and it was a it was a night game. I I was blown away, speechless. And then those people who know me know that I'm rarely speechless. It, 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 it just, uh, it's a whole nother level. Like Memorial Stadium in, in Nebraska would be like at a one. Bryant Denny would be at like 20. <laughs> it, 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 it was so dramatically different. And it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a, uh, it's a, like I've said before, it's, it's more of a social event and a very important social event than <laughs> no a game. Kidding. You know what? All the people that have come down here and expressed their thoughts on the game day, that may be the most impactful I've heard. One to 20? And yeah. you're from Nebraska. I know. It's great. It hey, next me to hour. Say that. That's all right. Uh, you're getting better. Better and better. <laughs> um, hey, when we get back on the other side of the hour, Nick Kelly from the Tuscaloosa News will join us and continue to talk about Alabama LSU and a few other things. Lars has got to talk NFL and there's some other college football things going on. Hello, Michigan. Be back in a minute. WTBC Tuscaloosa and W265CG Tuscaloosa, a town square media station. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. From the Fox Sports Studios in Los Angeles. Here's Nick Cope. News in the NFL as Giants coach Brian Dayball confirmed what everyone feared. Quarterback Daniel Jones did tear his ACL during Sunday's loss to the Raiders and is out for the season. That leaves undrafted rookie Tommy DeVito and Matt Barkley as the only healthy quarterbacks on New York's roster. Eagles tight end Dallas Goddard suffered a forearm fracture during the win over the Cowboys. NFL media reports he's likely to have surgery today and is expected to miss four weeks. The Steelers placed linebacker Cole Holcomb on season-ending injured reserve with a knee injury sustained last Thursday night. They also activated running back Anthony McFarland. The Athletic reports the Cowboys will work out receiver Martavis Bryant on Tuesday. And in baseball, the Guardians announced they've hired former All-Star catcher Stephen Vogt as their next manager. The third 39-year-old spent 10 years in the big leagues, mostly with the A's. He spent last season with the Mariners as their bullpen coach. From T-Town to the Plains, this is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Up next for the Alabama Crimson Tide following their 42-28 win over LSU. Up next, Lexington, Kentucky, this Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. Kentucky 6-3 and three overall and a very respectable 3-3 three and three in the East Division of the Southeastern Conference. So there you have it set up. Make your game plans. It'll be an SEC Network game. And uh, sometimes I like the early ones, Lars. So I used to not like them because of my lifestyle. Now I don't like them because of my lifestyle. <laughs> Everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Age oh, okay. age does uh, certain things to you, doesn't it? Um, I can appreciate an early bedtime. Uh, some nights. Some nights. Not all nights. Hey, all right. There, there are a couple games around the country I just want to touch on uh, from Saturday. Uh, one is uh, Ohio State playing Rutgers. Ohio State wins 35-16. But they struggled. And they uh, just uh, – Kyle McCord, their quarterback, is – he's he, he's not an elite quarterback. He's and inconsistent. He, he is. He'll be elite one week, and then the next week he's, you know, average. yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that the Notre Dame game was a great example of that. He struggled for most of the game and then leads a brilliant drive late, and Ohio State wins that game and keeps their national championship hopes alive. And, um, you know, what Ohio State does have is Marvin Harrison Jr., who I think is probably wow. the best best player in the country. I mean, he's Especially just... Especially uh, Bowers is down now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, we'll see, but uh, and we'll get into the sign stealing stuff here in a second. But when Ohio State plays Michigan, you got to give Michigan uh, a big time advantage in that game. Um, and then you look to uh, out west. What, what a crazy game! Washington fifty two, USC forty two. <laughs> I mean, USC, can you play just a little defense? Uh, you have this transcendent offensive player in Caleb Williams, and you just wasted him because your defense is so awful. And uh, there have been reports that Lincoln Riley, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is, I, I don't know the accuracy of this, but just the, the scuttlebutt is that Lincoln Riley is looking uh, toward the NFL and it has his eyes specifically on, on, on the Las Man, Vegas that's, job. That, that's just, wow. uh, that's, that's just again, rumor, scuttlebutt. Well, he um, fired, he fired Alex Grinch, their DC. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> he pretty much had to after you give up 52 to Washington. I mean, come on. Um, Michael Pennis Jr., baby. Yeah. He's, he's pretty good. He should win the Heisman. He should win the Heisman. Um, Oklahoma State beats Oklahoma 27-24. Um, and now it looks like uh, <laughs> Oklahoma State. I mean, this Oklahoma State team got beat by South Alabama, which I don't know if that says more about Oklahoma State or South Alabama. But now the uh, the Pokes are in the driver's seat to get into the Big 12 championship game. And uh, because uh, the, the rest of their schedule is uh, UCF, Houston, and, and BYU. So Oklahoma State now is odds-on favorite to play Texas. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sad to see that this uh, rivalry between Oklahoma State and Oklahoma is ending. Bedlam is ending. But um, good way for Oklahoma State. So, you know, Alabama fans, you better be uh, paying attention to Oklahoma State because you need Oklahoma State to beat Texas uh, in the Big 12 championship game. If Texas actually makes it there, Texas hasn't looked great either. And it's so funny, Matt, uh, not funny, but it, it, it's just strange how college football works. When Alabama has this really strong performance a lot of other teams struggled and suddenly Alabama is like, oh, wow, this team, you know, this is from what reporters are thinking, uh, my, my buddies across the country, they're like, wow, Alabama hitting their stride. Alabama is back. Alabama may be now, you know, one of the top two, three teams in the country. You know, we'll wait to see. But uh, another game is interesting to me, o o Oregon State 26, Colorado 19. Um, Colorado really struggling. Um, and it was it was so weird that uh, Deion Sanders, right before the game, basically demoted his offensive coordinator. So he didn't, so uh, um, Sean Lewis, uh, he wasn't calling the plays, and in the uh, the end of the uh, first half, Deion Sanders just made some absolutely crazy decisions. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, he, Deion Sanders. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes, but things are kind of off. Calling the, the plays. Things are kind of off the rails at the. Uh, he well, he was managing the game. Um, uh, and he, uh, he, he didn't say it was a mistake to change the, the play callers, but it, I think it probably was, um, any other, any games that caught your eye other than, uh, Nebraska losing <laughs> to Michigan state. Oh my God. It was the first meaningful game. It was the first meaningful game that Nebraska's played in about 20 years. And they just go to East Lansing and lay an egg. That's hard to understand. That's and, just a game of college football. Yeah, and the beat goes on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, any any games from the SEC catch your attention, Matt? Well, you know, I, I think Auburn continues to perform on kind of a, you know, they're getting better, getting better. 
I mean, that wasn't the most impressive win, but it was on the road. And Nashville, you know, not the most intimidating place to play. But um, And Vanderbilt, honestly, I hate to say this because I always want them to be, but they're not very good at all. Um, and Auburn, not very good earlier. I think they're getting better. Um, but they have won their way into a chance of playing into a bowl game. Um, I think they've, they've made the decision to keep Peyton Thorne at quarterback and go with it. So we'll see how this continues to roll out. Um, I have to say something for my little piggies, little piggies. Boy, did we need a win, and we got it. Beating Florida, which is another one of those teams that's just hard to figure out. But, you know, those are a couple that pop off the, pop off the screen to me right away. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I was interested in the uh, Georgia-Missouri game. Um, Georgia ends up winning 30-21 to 21 in Athens. Um, Georgia was a 14-point favorite, and, of course, I took Georgia. And, by the way, our buddy Reagan at R&R texted us, uh, letting us know that he was a perfect 4-0. Congratulations, Reagan. That was like at the final whistle of the final game. Oh, I did. It was. He was just. He was chomping at the bit. He was chomping at the bit to send that text out. Four and zero all year. Um, but uh, I don't know what to think about this Georgia team. They just. Uh, they haven't been as dominating as I thought they were going to be. And uh, it will be interesting to see how they perform next Saturday in Athens against Ole Miss. Um, and the Rebels haven't played in Athens since uh, 2012. And oddly, Ole Miss is the only remaining SEC team that Kirby Smart has not defeated. Now, does that mean anything? No. They hadn't but, played often. Yeah, <laughs> that's all that means. However, this this is not a uh, a juggernaut of a team right now. Now they may become one, but if you just base on base based on what we saw on Saturday, who would be the favorite on a neutral site between Georgia, Alabama? Alabama. Yeah. Right now, I think it'd be a pick 'em. I think it would be a pick 'em too. Uh, and I wouldn't I'll have said you. that. Wouldn't have said that. No. Uh, last six week. weeks ago. Yeah. No, I wouldn't have said it last week. Um, I will tell you one thing: they miss Bowers. There's no question. But yeah, Delp they do. can play. Number four, who uh, plays that slot, that tight end position for Kirby Smart. He's really, really good too. Hey, we're gonna talk some more Alabama football and some basketball, perhaps, on the other side of the break. As Nick Kelly from the T News will join us here on Big Noon Sports, presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage. Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama Broker, who's as roll-tied as houndstooth, will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205 790 7229. Again, that's 205 790 7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at the Bama Broker.com. That's Laura Lee at the Bama Broker.com. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A mild afternoon with a good supply of sunshine. The high today, 77. Tonight, fair with the low at 53. And the weather stays dry tomorrow and Wednesday. Partly to mostly sunny both days. Highs between 78 and 81. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 76 degrees in Tuscaloosa. More big noon sports coming up.
indeed, and you just heard about Laura Lee Thompson. We'll uh, emphasize her once again. She is the Bama broker. She'll be with us this Friday at Ennis Free. That's the place to be on all of Alabama football weekends and then some. So we thank Laura Lee Thompson for her participation in our show and as a sponsor as well. Joining us now for the Tuscaloosa News is Nick Kelly. Nick, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. I mean, we've got spring and summer back. But first thing I want to <laughs> ask you before we go back to Saturday night, did Nick say anything electric? We, we played and aired and listened to his Monday morning news conference. Um, they're not really usually very electric, but this one was very vanilla in my opinion. Yeah, not a ton. I mean, obviously it was interesting to get his take on uh, the Dallas Turner hit on Jaden Daniels. Um, Some folks have been talking about that a bit. Uh, And then um, just the injuries, too. I I thought it was uh, what he said about Lawson and Key and and getting those guys back. Um, And just in terms of uh, just because they might be able to play in the game, they got to be able to play in practice, too. So uh, he didn't give a an update that made me think like, Oh, they're for sure playing on, on Saturday. So, uh, we'll be curious to see how that progresses for them. Um, and frankly, it might make more sense for guys like that to, uh, try to rest them up for say the Auburn game, uh, because you can, you know, against the Chattanooga next week, you don't necessarily need all your guys. If they're not completely healthy. Um, don't tell coach Saban. I said that, <laughs> uh, one, I'm looking ahead and two, I'm looking past an opponent, but, I think it's that's the opponent to probably do that for. Uh, but overall, I think uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Maybe they make sure those guys are healthy for the stretch run, um, especially because they can't really lose uh, a game right now. They still want to make the playoff, and, and even if they don't lose, it's not guaranteed they do make the playoff. And so uh, interesting times right now, and those are a couple of things I took away from his press conference. Nick, uh, you've had a uh, front row seat to uh, to Jalen Milrow all season. You've been talking to him all season, talking to coaches, talking to his teammates. Uh, can you just discuss the evolution of Jalen? And also, did you see his incredible performance? And I think that's a fair adjective. Uh, did you see it coming on Saturday night? Hundred uh, percent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I I, uh, I I thought he was gonna have a good day, um, just because. Let's be honest, that LC defense is not very good, and they had guys out. So if there was a chance for him to do well, that was a good game for it. Um, did I see him running for four touchdowns? No, I did not. Uh, but no, he he looked really, I mean, sharp. Just and that's you talk about his evolution. For me. Early on, he was a guy who obviously he had some talent, he had some ability, um, but didn't always look too comfortable. And, and he seemed to make a few panic moves every so often, or a few moves that you just wouldn't. I don't think he probably would make if he was really thinking it through. Um, but he just looks more comfortable, and that's where I think his evolution has been: is his ability to run the offense and to take what the defense is giving him. Um, and I think his willingness to run is, is showing that because he's a guy who he'll tell you and people around him will tell you like he's always been a passer. Like, like everyone thinks about his running because he's, he's electric as a runner, but he's always been a guy uh, who's a strong passer and a guy who wants to be a passer. Um, and so he maybe leaned on that a little bit too much of being very firm and I want to be a passer and that's what I want to be. Um, but there are times where, I mean, look at Jaden Daniels where, you know, Jaden Daniels has been a great passer this season, but, uh, there are times when the defense gives you a great wide open look, you got to take it and not try to prolong it and then get sacked. Um, and I think Jaden, or I should say Jalen, it, it's a tongue twister saying those two names uh, too close to each other. But uh, but Jalen Milrow, um, I think that he's learning when to run uh, even better. Uh, and, and I think he's just, he, he looks more confident and calm. And, and those are two things that, you really need as a quarterback. If you don't have it, you make plays like he did in the Texas game where he threw that really bad interception. I think it was, what, in the flat or whatever it was. I just remember it was bad. <laughs> it feels like forever ago now. But um, And it doesn't mean he can't make mistakes and he won't make mistakes, but his just confidence and poise is so much better than it was early in the season. And that maybe shouldn't be surprising because sometimes that stuff just takes time. I remember uh, talking to someone early in the the season saying that you can't really evaluate a guy until he's had at least half a season worth of starts. Um, 
and now he's had that and I think we're seeing uh, why the coaching staff uh, has liked coaching him and why they put their faith Hey, extend the observation on Milrow to the media room and to the national television interviews. He just seems like a much happier guy. Yeah, he's really, I mean, he's got a great energy. And, and he's, I mean, even last year, I remember when he replaced Bryce, that was the first time we talked to him uh, in that Arkansas game. Um, he was smiling big. And, I mean, Jalen loves to smile. And he's just, he's got this uh, good energy to him. And, uh, yeah, he's very much so having fun. And he's cracking jokes. And, making you know jokes about not wanting to make Nick Saban mad and, uh which a lot of guys would be nervous to do that kind of thing but you can tell him and coach Saban have a good relationship because if he's willing to do that at the podium uh that's a good sign for where their relationship is at because he's not trying to you know walk in eggshells so to speak and um so now Jalen's got I think just a great poise right now on the field at the podium uh great energy and he's playing well and, and that obviously translates to how you talk <laughs> when you're playing well it's a lot easier to face the media when that happens uh, what's your analysis of this? Is also an evolution question of of this the the play calling by by Tommy Reese and uh, and sort of where the Alabama offense is right now? Yeah, I, I mean, I think he had his best game with Alabama on Saturday. Uh, just not only in what they were calling, but just the pacing of it and when to call certain things and. Um, like I love that wheel route that he called that was a Jam Miller uh, that went for like I think 35 yards. Um, Kendrick Law, the usage with him in the backfield some, and then having him uh, catch that flat pass out of the backfield. Like I like that. Um, there's just some nice creativity in using the weapons you have because they have a lot of different kind of guys to use. Um, and trying to figure out figure out how to use them is maybe not the easiest thing. But I think uh, Saturday was a great step in terms of that creativity because I mean it, it's a little tough to say that this offense is going to dominate everyone from here on out because LSU's defense, again, is not the best defense they have faced or they will face. Um, but the fact that Tommy was willing to call these certain plays, uh, to me, is really encouraging because it shows creativity. It shows uh, just some sharpness on his part. So I, I think if you're an Alabama fan, you have to be really encouraged by what Tommy Reese did on Saturday. Yeah, I think when you can make midweek adjustments to your offense and then run out there and run them effectively – that's just showing confidence, just bleeding crimson all over the place. That's just a quick observation from me. Now, right now, based on what you've seen, if Alabama were to play Georgia, who'd be favored? <laughs> who would you favor? I mean, who I would pick, I would pick Alabama, and that's not necessarily because of my location uh, and who I serve uh, for readers, but I, I genuinely believe it. I think Alabama is playing – their best football right now it's some of the best football we've seen from them all year and it's it's a group that has not only strong defense but also some really strong offense um now of course if they were playing in athens that'd be one thing uh but i think in Atlanta, i like alabama's chances georgia's solid um now <laughs> they play right now that's of course without brock bowers assuming brock bowers could probably come back at some point that might make it a little closer um but i think georgia's definitely vulnerable um in a spot where alabama could beat uh, could beat them, and I think if they played 10 times, it might be a 60-40, 50-50 kind of split right now. There are a lot of uh, national media people saying that uh, Nick Saban should be considered uh, a, a, a legit candidate to be a coach of the year, and that this may be his finest uh, job of coaching in his uh, tenure at Alabama. Do you do you agree with that? And uh, if 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 so, what 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 has made this uh, arguably one of Nick's best best jobs? Yeah, I I think is he deserving of it? I think so. Will he win it? I I don't know about that. It depends on how they finish. Um, because to me, I wrote about this yesterday actually about in terms of SEC coach of the year. Um, to me. It, it's hard sometimes to pick a coach who's well established and also whose team had. I mean, they were picked to win, to win the SEC West coming into the year, um, so it's not quite like a Missouri where they were picked to finish right above Vanderbilt in the SEC East and might finish second. Um, so I think that's what's working against him. But in terms of his coaching jobs, I think it's very fair to say this is one of his best over his 17 seasons in Tuscaloosa. Um, and the reason I say that is because the expectations once this team 
went to South Florida and played as poorly as they did, especially offensively, I mean, it felt like they were going to be lucky to win an SEC game, much less you know beat the likes of LSU or Tennessee um, after that game. And, and so the fact they went from that to having a – because, yeah, they have four stars, they have five stars. I mean, they've got talented guys in the pipeline. Um, but what he's done with a team that looked like it had very little going for it uh, to now likely winning the SEC West and having a chance to win the SEC and also having a chance to make the college football playoff, um, that's remarkable to me. And that tells me he's coached uh, just consistency in them. He's coached, you know, helped them become more mature, helped them uh, – just develop as football players. So that's why I think he is very deserving of national recognition for what he's done. But just because of the, the standard he set and because of the success they've had, he might not win that just because, say, let's just say they win the SEC, but they don't make the playoffs. Let's just say they make it to Atlanta like we expect. Um, they will. Maybe that won't be enough. Now, if he wins the national championship, <laughs> you know, I think he definitely would be uh, deserving of that. But I think it's, he'd still be deserving of that. He makes the college football playoffs. So, I think there's a difference between if he's deserving, if he actually wins it, I think prior success at Alabama is going to hurt them or hurt him in terms of maybe yeah. officially winning awards. But I think you can very safely say this is one of his top three, if not his top coaching job he's done at Alabama. Will it be a tough task for Nick Saban to get Alabama ready for Kentucky and how good are the Wildcats? See, I was, I had some trepidation uh, just because, Hey, Alabama easily find themselves uh, in a spot where it just beat LSU, just beat Tennessee, being really confident, beat two rivals. Um, but to me, one encouraging thing I heard today from Malachi Moore is he talked about how they're viewing every game as an elimination game. And they see it as they basically got to win out if they want to still make the playoff. Um, and so I think they understand that. I think that's going to help them stay focused. Uh, maybe they're not as sharp just because it is a road game. It's against, you know, a Kentucky team that's not as good as maybe what they played the last two weeks. Um, but I I get the sense hearing from Malachi and, and Jalen, they're still pretty locked in. They're not just taking victory laps all week uh, after LSU. Uh, sorry, well, sorry about that. Um, sorry about that. Uh, just um, reflecting back on the whole season, could you envision, and I think we've, I've asked you a version of this question before, could you have seen where this team was after the South Florida game to where they are now? And it, it is amazing to me as I talk to, you know, my reporter friends around the country, uh, when I talked to him yesterday, uh, just telling me, man, Alabama's back. Holy cow. Like suddenly <laughs> Alabama is viewed and Jalen Milroe is viewed in a completely different light. And just, uh, again, the transformation from South Florida to now, uh, did, did you think it was possible? <laughs> I mean, I thought it was, I don't, I don't want to say, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, but I think it was very clear that Jalen needed to be the guy after we saw Buckner and Simpson against South Florida. Um, so I think that there was some hope just in, in that, okay, if with Jalen, they can do better than what we saw in that South Florida game. Um, but I think there's also a difference between reality and narratives. I think because of what happened in and game a year ago, a season ago, I should say, um, people painted Jalen as someone who's always going to be mistake free. can't really pass. He's only going to run. Um, and, and to me, I never quite bought into that. Like, yeah, I knew that he wasn't Bryce young. Um, but I think it was more, okay. This guy li literally came in for one game to start um, last season. And so that's very limited sample size. We need to give this guy some more time to see what he can be. Cause I think you talk to anyone, he, they'll tell you he's probably the best athlete on the team. Um, so it's like, you can work with that. You need to have a guy who's your best athlete on the team playing. Um, and, and he's shown, and we knew he had a strong arm. I mean, the guy's built like a linebacker. I mean, like he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's chiseled. I mean, he, I, one of his, I think his high school coach once told me he looks like a Greek God kind of thing. Um, and, and so it's like, you knew the tools were there. It's just, can he put it together? Can he get better at coaching? And I think we're finally seeing that. So I think that this, uh, this, you know, we want it now, instant culture we live in, uh, was ready to say, hey, if Jalen's not this now, he's not going to be it. It's like, no, just give him some time. And again, don't be wrong, he's still got areas to improve in, but 
um, yeah, I think it was just patience somewhat with him. And, and I think that also the people who wanted to say Alabama was dead, Alabama was, uh, you know, dynasty's dead. Um, people are always looking for a chance to knock down the, <laughs> the top dog, so to speak. And I will say Alabama in some ways, Georgia is at the top of the SEC right now because they've won however, what, 26 straight games, two national championships. And so, uh, so it's not necessarily Alabama was the top team that had to be knocked down, but, um, but still it's Alabama and Nick Saban's still here. And so I think that people wanted to find any reason they could to say, this is, this is ending, this is over. And, and there was good reason to think that, I mean, they, they did not look good. Um, but I think it's just a reminder that you have to be patient a bit, uh, to see how things play out. Hey, Nick, people can pick up the paper, but other ways that they can read you and, and read all of the T news. Yeah. Just the Tuscaloosa news.com and, Find me on Twitter at underscore Nick Kelly, and uh, that's where all my stuff is. Great stuff as always. We'll let you get back to the pen. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good week. You too. There's, uh, believe it or not, Lars, there's more news out of Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt, Matt Rule just absolutely threw a big-time dig at him, too. He said, we own five and four, but one team scouted us. Wow. <laughs> the team that beat them. <laughs> yeah. and, and now Michigan wants to fight back at the Big Ten. It's it's rather an interesting commentary. I think, look, look the, these next 48 hours, the, the hammer is going to drop on Michigan, and I think it's going to drop hard. Wow. There's a perspective from Lars Anderson on Big Noon Sports. We'll be right back. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. Wow, this is just a wonderful time of year, and it is. Weather-wise, a little bit warmer than, than normal. But you've got your college football, you're beginning your college basketball. But <sighs> Lars, I just looked outside, it looks like it's about 4 o'clock. When... Is our country going to do think something about this daylight savings time facade? Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Sorry, I've just uh, been texting with uh, Matt Finkus, and he is going to jump on with us. Uh, Justin, you can give him a call to um, get the latest on what's going on with Michigan. And as a reminder, Matt uh, is a former all-American defensive end at Ohio State and um, now does uh, some media work in Columbus as well as other things. He played in the NFL. Matt and I got to know each other when I was writing a book on NFL Europe and I embedded with uh, the Scottish Claymores and 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 Matt's with us now. Hey, Matt, uh, thanks so much for uh, for jumping on on very short notice. Um, sure, can man. you just give us uh, give us an update of what is going on with uh, Michigan and the sign stealing? I just noticed that uh, Matt Rule in his press conference today said we own five and four, but we were also scouted by one opponent clearly referring to Michigan. And it just seems like there's this yeah. uh, gr growing anger among uh, Big Ten coaches and athletic directors. So just bring us up to speed of what's going on. Well, I mean, I don't think anyone really knows what's going on yet for certain. Obviously, everything's been kept pretty far um, under wraps. And I mean, what we do know is, you know, obviously there's an investigation going on and, um, you know, the, the president of the Big Ten met with the president of Michigan on Friday. Um, you know, I, I think that everyone with a brain who's seen any of the evidence, seen the videos, seen the guy talking to the coordinators on the sidelines, you know, the paper trail of the ticket purchases and everything, if all that stuff is accurate, which, I mean, being reported by some pretty legitimate news outlets, then obviously Michigan, you know, they cheated. Uh, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of other ways to, to go about that or to say it. Um, you know, they, they did something that you know, no other team in college football does. I mean, they, you know, they, they keep conflating, you know, trying to steal signs on the sideline with what they were doing, which was going to games, filming the other sidelines, which you can't ever see. 
you know, on any kind of tape that is exchanged between staffs or, I mean, you might catch a second of it or so on the, you know, on the, on a TV broadcast, like maybe six or seven times a game. But once you're able to record all of the signals and signs, match that to the game tape, you can start to decipher, you know, what is being done, what plays are being called, what checks are being made um, on both sides of the ball. And it, and it seems like that's what Michigan did. And if that's the case, I mean, there's no other way to, to describe it other than they, you know, they've cheated. They cheated the system and they've kind of put into question the entire integrity of the game. And I mean, yeah, it's bad for them, but it's not just bad for them. It's bad for everybody. <clears throat> you know, I mean, because now you're questioning everything. Now you're questioning the last few years. Um, you know, if they're allowed to continue in this season, um, you know, let's let's say they run the table and they run into, you know, a, you know, the college football playoffs. I mean, you know, what's the storyline going to be there? So, um, it's, I mean, it's a mess. It's a mess of seems to be of their own creating. You know, it, it seems like right now every report that's out there is they're just trying to paint this guy as a lone wolf. And, you know, he went out and did all this stuff and no one else knew. But, again, anyone who's ever played, um, you know, I've talked to tons of coaches that are in college football right now. I mean, everyone knows what's going on. I mean, everyone knew what happened. If you're on the sidelines and you've got a guy who all of a sudden is just telling you every single play that's, that's about to be run and it's happening not, you know, in the third and fourth quarter, it's happening from the start of the game. You know, there's something, something's up. And no, no one with, like I said, half a brain or who's coached or played at this level has any illusions about what Michigan was doing. Latest release out of Michigan that they were challenging the Big Ten to be careful about taking action before investigation. Does, um, does that hold any water? And kind of give us your idea, Maddie. What what time frame we're looking on? Are they going to do something here in forty eight hours? Or if they do anything, will it be after the season? And perhaps Michigan's won a national championship. Yeah, I think that um, you know I, I'm obviously not a, an attorney, um, but if you read the bylaws, um, you know the Big Ten is within its rights to act however they want to, and they can't appeal. The the commissioner can act temporarily and enforce any kind of action. And then the, the uh, joint uh, committee can, you know, vote and, and enforce the action as well. Once they've done that, they're not subject to appeal. Um, so I don't know legally if Michigan has a whole lot of legs to stand on with this. You know, obviously the NCAA rule, I mean, we saw with Pat Fitzgerald early in the season, no matter if you know what's happening or not, you're held responsible if it's on your staff. I think that's obviously going to apply to <laughs> to Jim Harbaugh mainly because, I mean, the guy was standing on the sideline with him and with all the coordinators talking to him the entire time. So um, if, if I had to guess, I would say that meeting on Friday was kind of a chance for the Big Ten to lay out what they've found so far and give Michigan the opportunity to maybe handle this in-house. And if they don't, then I think that there's been enough outcry from, you know, all the other member institutions. I mean, you've heard Purdue's head coach, you've heard Matt Rule. Um, you know, a lot of people have been pretty vocal about this and about what they've had. I mean, if the, if the paper trail is true of the ticket purchases and the budget and the spreadsheets and everything else, I mean, this is a lot of information and none of it's positive for Michigan. Yeah, and uh, just so our listeners know, you have a little bit of credibility when it comes to talking to coaches, given the fact that your college roommates were um, Mike Vrabel, the head coach of the Tennessee Titans, and Luke Fickle, the head coach of the Wisconsin Badgers. Um, there was one play in particular uh, in the Ohio State-Michigan game last year uh, that everyone has been analyzing uh, because there's this obvious video. It was second and nine. Right uh, and yeah, uh, uh, can, can we just can, yeah, yeah? Can you just review that for us? Can you review that for us? And and from a player's perspective, like how big of an advantage is it? Because you, you know, Deion yeah. Sanders commented the other day, he's like, "Hey, I don't care if yeah, I, I'll tell you any play we're running, you still got to stop it." <laughs> well, I mean, there's a certain part of that is true, but there's also, I mean, if you tell me what play's coming. 85% of the time, I'm going to stop that play. If you tell me what blitz is coming or what coverage you're in, 85% of the time, I'm going to be able to call something to beat it. Now, I mean, is there human error involved? Because there's 11 guys, there's 22 guys on the field? Sure. 
So, I mean, is it going to be 100%? Is it going to be perfect? No. But, I mean, <laughs> your odds vastly increase when you know exactly what's about to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at that play – down on the down on the red zone, a second and nine, and you know you've got some of the best wideouts in the country, and you're running, you know, a, basically a all-out blitz. Safety's not even looking at anyone. You're playing man coverage with a seven-yard cushion on Marvin Harrison Jr. in the red zone with C.J. Stroud as the quarterback. I mean, come on, you, <laughs> you know that that's a run. Then there's no way that you're playing any other thing except run at that because I mean. If, if I'm Ohio State and I know that that's the, the blitz you're bringing, I'm calling a slant. I'm going to score a touchdown and we're all going to celebrate. Um, I mean, that's that's the reality of kind of what's happened here. And, you know, I mean, and, and again, I think, it, you know, this speaks to the problem at, on a larger level. You don't know. I mean, no one knows how many plays. No one knows how many things were affected over, you know, how many schools and, you know, I mean, what, what was going on and, I mean, you know, they go back. You go back to the TCU game, and TCU was able to send in false signals and stuff. And I mean, was Michigan relying on that? And they bailed out of it, you know, in the second half or whatever. Just so many questions that now are going to hang over this team, the team of the past two years, the team this year. It's just, it's. I mean, it's bad for college football all the way around. Matt Finkus is our guest here on Big Noon Sports. Matt will uh, Harbaugh coach again in twenty four. Man, I mean that's a, that's a great question. I mean, if if I mean I'll I'll couch it with this: if half of what is being alleged is true, I don't see how that's going to happen. I think he's going to have to bail and go to the NFL. Um, it's just, I mean, you, you've done so. This isn't just you know a recruiting violation or you know paying a player or an NIL infraction. I mean, this goes to the heart of competition, <laughs> and that's I mean that's I don't think we I mean there's never there's no precedent for this. No one's ever done this before. No one's ever attempted to, you know, to do this or, you know, to do it on this scale ever before that's been re- reported or that I know of. So, I mean, this is totally new territory. And it's, again, I mean, I just, I go back to it. You're calling into question the integrity of the game. And it's not just Michigan. It's not just Ohio State. It's not just the Big Ten. But it's, all, I mean, you know, if they, if they go on to, and run the table and play Georgia, I mean, how do you know that, <laughs> that the information isn't still sitting there in Tim Beckler Hall? You know, how many? How do you know that they haven't scouted Georgia and have their signs? And now you got to force the team to, to go change the way they communicate over you know a three week period before they play them. I mean, that's a that's a huge competitive disadvantage. So there's just so much to this that is you know so many different levels to it, and none of it is good. No, none of it is good. And uh, I mean, you mentioned you're not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, thank goodness. Um, but <laughs> if Let's just say, uh, and I'd have to go back and, and really analyze all this, but let's say you're a head coach and uh, your job is on the line and you get throttled 60 to nothing by Michigan and you get fired and it turns out that they knew your signs. Could there be civil litigation? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, who knows? I mean, that's a, I, I mean, lawyers will sue for anything, right? I mean, so. <laughs> Could Scott Frost go get an attorney? You, you I mean you never know. But yeah, exactly. Um, oh, you'll you yeah. But, uh, trust me, I I know too much about that. Scott Frost. And but attorneys. yeah, I mean I, I I don't know. Um, I mean that's the thing. I mean, again, that goes to my point. Like you're you you now just question everything. You you question how much this affected and to what degree and 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 again just everything. I mean, did did this make a team who was two and four in the COVID year and you know, had been routinely just an average Big Ten football team, all of a sudden an elite level team? I mean, it looks that way. <laughs> if you just go by the records and the statistics, I mean... Uh, it, it, Matt, if I could just follow it's, it's hard. Quick. It's hard to say. Um, look, I, I know you're Ohio State all the way, but does part of you just as a former college football player feel bad for the Michigan kids? Because 100%. everything 100%. could get taken yeah. away from them. Good yeah, I mean, a hundred percent, you feel bad for them. I mean, even if they knew, you know, that hey, our coaches know the plays. There's probably a really, really good chance that they knew they didn't know that Connor Stallions was out there running this operation to get it illegally. So, I mean, you do feel bad for those players. You do feel bad for those guys because it's once again, I mean, how it happens a lot of times in college football. 
it's you know it's not the players' fault a lot of times. It's the, it's the administrators and guys who've made some really bad decisions, and the players are going to suffer for it. And the way the NCAA you know works, I mean, they're going to you know it's going to be three years now before anything really happens, and then it's, is it going to affect? kids that are, you know, playing in high school right now that are going to go to Michigan later. So, again, it, it's a mess. You do feel bad for those kids, um, you know, because I don't think it, this is anything, you know, they knew about or they were a part of, but now it's on their doorstep. And well, here they are likely to accept penalties for the adults. Yeah. Yep. It's always the adults. Always the adults, man. <laughs> when it comes to college kids football. Kids play outside. You kids play outside. Well, we screw everything up here over the dinner table. <laughs> okay. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot. You, you, hey, especially yep. on the fly. Yeah, yep, thanks, No problem, Matt. guys. Thanks, yep. buddy. Okay. All right. We will wrap up this uh, Monday edition of Big Noon Sports in Literally Moments. Securing the best mortgage possible requires a lender who has knowledge, is trustworthy, and treats customers like family. And no one is better at all of this than the mortgage miracle worker, Haley Sansing. Based right here in Tuscaloosa, Haley Sansing has spent decades working in the mortgage industry. With Haley, it's personal, holding your hand from contract to close. With Haley, it's about one thing, you. Call Haley on her cell, yes, her cell, 205-792-1813. That's 205-792-1813. Let Haley help you. NLMS number 230376. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa the weather. A mild afternoon with a good supply of sunshine. The high today 77. Tonight fair with the low at 53. And the weather stays dry tomorrow and Wednesday. Partly to mostly sunny both days. Highs between 78 and 81. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 76 degrees in Tuscaloosa. Covering SEC sports like Good Zoo on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. Really good show. Our thanks to our presenting sponsor, Haley Sensing Union Home Mortgage, and also to Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama broker. As uh, we've had a terrific Monday show, we let it off with Nick Saban's comments following LSU leading to Kentucky, and a great intel from Nick Kelly of the Tuscaloosa News. And then Lars uh, got Matt Finkus on at last minute to talk about Michigan. Lars, you got any real feel for this? Are there going to be in-season punishments here? I think there has to be. Don't you? I mean, I, I think they need to be yeah, banned. Yeah, but I don't think it's going to happen. Well, the Wall Street Journal's reporting, is, uh, as, as you uh, alluded to, that Michigan is already threatening lawsuit, injunction, uh, lack of due process. Um, so there will be lawyers involved. Okay, and it's just it's just a colossal mess because I think Matt Fink has brought up so many good points. You know, this is a team that went two and four in the COVID year, and suddenly they're the best team in the country. Like, right. <laughs> you know, and 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 then as a you know former All American, he was able to really break down what a competitive advantage you have when you know what's coming. And and, and again, the the evidence is just, it's, it's overwhelming. You know, it's not in drips and drabs. It's a, a tidal wave, a tsunami of evidence that these guys cheated. And the thing is, you have to act in real time if you're the Big Ten commissioner. Otherwise, uh, the integrity of the game is, is sacrificed. I don't know. What do you think? I think that uh, it was a really good call on your part to get Finkus on because he has given me so much food for thought mm -hmm. that I'm going to sit down after the show and think about what he said. You know, particularly just kind of did one of those V8 moments. They were two and four during the COVID year? Yeah. 
Wow. Hey, we'll pick this up again in 22 hours. How about that, Lars? Sounds great. Hey, thanks to Justin Jones. Join Tide 100.3.